Hello, everyone. We have we have some people already already uh, connected. We're here for the live webinar. Do you trade goods or services with the US? The E1 visa may be right for you. We have a wonderful guest, Angie Rupert. And we're gonna be starting in, in a couple of minutes. Thank you everybody for being here. Um, you can all use the chat. Let us know where you are located, where you're coming from. We would love to hear from you. And there's also a questions tab on the right hand side where you can feel free to add any questions that you would like and we can ask our uh, wonderful guest at the end. Okay. Great. Live webinar. Do you trade goods or services with the US? The E1 visa may be right for you. Okay. I think we can get started now. Let's do this. Thank you everybody who registered for the event. We're very happy to have you here with us to discuss this great topic that I believe it's not talked about enough in our opinion, and it's worth sharing the message and knowledge from someone who knows all about it. The title of our webinar today, as I was saying, is do you trade goods or services with the US? The E1 visa may be right for you. And I will soon be introducing our amazing guest. I first want to introduce myself. My name is Marianela Mansour. I'm the Director of Sales and Marketing at Journey Business Plans. Journey is a company that specializes in preparing business plans for many different purposes, mainly immigration. For many of the business visas, a document that explains the business that you will be applying with is necessary, and that's where we come in. We support applicants and lawyers with this part of the process, preparing a comprehensive business plan and making sure it's right for immigration purposes. We're here today to talk about the E-1 visa or the trader visa that exists for those who trade goods or services with the US and are part of a treaty country. To share her knowledge on this matter, we have invited one of our most important partners, founder of the LA-based law firm Rupert Law, Angie Rupert. Rupert Law is specialized in E2 investor visas and E1 trader visas. And their main lawyer, Angie Rupert, is a beacon of knowledge and professionalism in her field. With an impressive history that includes assisting clients worldwide with their visa applications, plus always insisting on frequent communication for unparalleled client service, Angie and her firm are committed to growth for companies across industries. From legal to finance, Rupert Law has provided legal support strategies to businesses ranging from startups to 100 million revenue entities. Aside from all her achievements as a lawyer, Angie Rupert is also a personal and a company friend to Journey who has worked with us for more than five years. So it's really great to have her join us today. Welcome, Angie. Thanks, Marianella. Wow, that was like quite a, an entrance uh, or an, an entree to this uh, webinar. So I'm super excited to be here. And um, as you said, we really focus on E2s and E1s. And um, so we are really excited to speak about the E1, as you mentioned. Um, the E-1 is an underutilized U.S. visa, and it's really quite amazing, really, really flexible. And um, if someone does a lot of importing, exporting, or has U.S. clients, it could be a really great fit. So I'm super excited to be here. Thanks so much, Marianella. Amazing. Thank you, Angie, for being here. Uh, so before we dive into the questions, uh, feel free to add any comments on the chat on the right-hand side and also use the questions tab on the right-hand side, and we will be getting those uh, to those at the end. Uh, so let's dive in, Angie. Uh, let me start with, with one. Uh, let's start with E-Visa 101. So mm -hmm. what does it entail? The basics. So just like the E2, you have to be from a treaty country. Um, however, you should really check out that uh, treaty country list because there are some countries that are eligible for E1 that are not eligible for E2. The one that comes to mind, for example, is Greece. Greece is not eligible for E2, but it is eligible for E1. So even if you think eh, it may not be from a treaty country, it's worth checking that out. So that's 
Item number one, right, is being uh, having a passport from a treaty country. That's really important. Uh, and then number two is really about the E1 is really about a history of trade with the United States. Mm -hmm. So the E2 is a little bit different. And we'll talk about kind of the similarities and differences a little bit later today. But for the E1, what we're really looking for is a substantial and continued trade between your home country and the United States. Mm -hmm. So um, looking for either, hey, we export a lot of stuff from the United States and bring it to our home country to sell or what have you, or the opposite, right? We import a lot of stuff to the United States um, from our home country, sell it there. However, the thing that people should know is it's not necessarily just about goods, right? It's not about, oh, we sell a bunch of pencils in the U.S. that are sent from our home country, or we we buy a ton of pencils from the U.S. and sell them in our home country. That works, and that's fine, but also think about services. So we have a couple of different service clients, um, one from Italy right now, who um, actually does all of the work in Italy. Everything's being done, but it's a marketing and business development company that works with U.S. universities and colleges. So his clients are in the U.S. All the services are done in Italy, but he's not trading pencils or apples. He's trading services, and that can work as well. So for those of you who have consulting businesses or you know service-based businesses, this could be a perfect visa for you. Amazing. So those are the two, That's great. the really the main things, right? There's, there's a lot of detail, but those are mm -hmm. kind of the overall. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. And, and thank you for, for giving us that, that really good summary. So now I want to break it down a little bit. So let's start with the nationality part. Can you name some of the, um, the countries that are on that list that are uh, a treaty country and can be eligible for an E1 visa? Yes, for sure. So, Two of the uh, most frequent E1 applicants are Canada and Mexico um, for obvious reasons, right? They're right here, right next door. Mm -hmm. So anyone from Canada with a Canadian passport, anyone with a Mexican passport, um, certainly they are, they are more than eligible. Um, most E2 uh, treaty countries are also okay. E1, not all, but most. Um, other really important E1 partners, many from uh, Italy, many from Turkey, many from Germany, Taiwan, and Japan. Those are the most. However, you know, anyone that has a, a, a treaty passport could be a, a trader, but those are the most frequent ones that we see, and they have the most applications. Canada, Mexico, Japan, Germany, Taiwan, Turkey, Italy. Those are the top. Yeah. Wonderful. And for our Latin American uh, clients also, or people who are interested, um, Colombia, Argentina, those yes. would be uh, applicable as well. Yes. And, and then Chile that, as well. Yeah. Yes. Okay. And then in that regard, I wanted to, to tell uh, people who are watching uh, the webinar is that we're going to have this same webinar also in Spanish with Angie Steam. To make sure that, I mean, if, if you feel more comfortable speaking Spanish, I'm originally from Colombia, so I'm happy to, to, to also do this webinar in Spanish. We're going to do that uh, in a couple of weeks, so we'll keep you posted. Yeah. Great, Angie. Um, so in uh, the purpose of, of keeping the, the breakdown about the E1 visa, I want to ask you, so as, as in the E2 visa, it talks about substantial investment. Now in the E1 trader visa, it talks about substantial trade. What, mm -hmm. what does that mean? That's a good question. It's, it's this, the answer is similar to what is a substantial investment, right? I guess substantial is kind of in the eyes of the beholder, but we definitely have recommendations for that. So our recommendation is kind of based on a couple of different things. One is on your business, your actual business in your home country, which is usually how the E1 works. So um, if your home country has a lot of revenues, right? So we have seven figure revenues, a million or something, you'll probably need more trade with the United States. If it's a smaller business, um, revenues under a million, 
also you can have trade with the U.S. and you can still get an E1, but probably the amount of trade will vary a little bit. Mm -hmm. So for those smaller businesses, we always recommend at least $150,000 worth of goods or services trading between the two countries within 12 months. Mm -hmm. And we recommend at least six trades, right? So the example of that is if you buy, this is another real life example. Uh, we had a Mexican company that bought a lot of um, medical equipment from the United States. So um, if you had a company similar to that, we don't wanna see you buying two pieces of, of equipment that total about $150,000 in February and then nothing else, right? Mm -hmm. We would want to see at least six trades. So even if they are 30 or $40,000 a piece, but you have you know, six of them over the course of 12 months, because it's not only substantial, but the trade also must be continuous. Mm -hmm. So they want to see it back and forth, back and forth. Mm -hmm. So for a smaller company with revenues under a million, that could work 150,000. You know, obviously the more the merrier always. Over mm -hmm. a million, we'll want to see more than that, right? Because mm -hmm. we don't want to see a company that has $25 million worth of revenues and 150,000 of that comes from the US. That's not really gonna be considered substantial at that point. Um, again, there are no numbers associated with this. Unfortunately, the Department of State does not give us a percentage, yeah. but that kind of gives you an idea um, as far as that goes. And for people also who have, um, so, who have clients in the US, for example, mm -hmm. Um, we like to see multiple clients, right? I don't want to see one client in the U.S. that pays you $30,000 a month, okay. right? We would like to see three, four, five U.S. clients paying you multiple times throughout the year and that type of thing. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Angie. That's, that's definitely more uh, tangible than substantial trade. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. And I think this is yeah. like one of the most important parts of the webinar. Like, what does that substantial trade mean? So, so thank you for that uh, clarification. Um, so now I want to ask you, Angie, um, does the U.S. have any preference that those are exports from the U.S. to that country? Or they don't mind if it's import, export, they don't have any preference, they just need to show trade? It's correct. The number two is your answer. So mm -hmm. another real life example of an E1 that we just had approved two or three weeks ago. So this was a gentleman who had actually, now this is a little bit different, but it still works. He had a U.S. entity. So many times with an E1, you're going to have an entity in your home country, but not in the U.S., and that is okay. That's one of the main benefits for the E1 is you don't have to have a U.S. entity. But in this instance, he did have a U.S. entity. He was not living in the U.S. and he was not working in the U.S., but he had this U.S. entity with, with a U.S. employee kind of running everything in his absence. But he was trading, he was bringing goods from his home country into the United States. And then selling it to selling it wholesale to a lot of other providers, right? So he had kind of a pet food type, pet food and pet products business. So he was importing pet food and pet products from his home country and then into his U.S. entity. The U.S. entity was buying these products and then wholesaling them to, you know, places like Petco, things like that, and then selling them in that way. That was also an E1. In the case of the Mexican, um, uh, E1 applicant that we were talking about earlier, he had a company in Mexico, no company in the United States, but he would come to the U.S. on very short trips, always with that kind of, you know, uh, yeah. potential issue at the airport. Have I been here too much? Do they think I'm trying to work here or live here on the, the B1 or the border crossing card, right? Mm -hmm. And so he would come in for very short trips, buy a bunch of stuff, go back home. And, uh, but he wanted to be able to, to do that for longer periods of time, not worry about it at the airport, that type of thing. And that's exactly what he did. So that was exporting from the U.S. The other one was importing too. Both approved, both totally fine. Yeah. Okay. And Angie, for example, in, in that particular example, that could have been an E2. 
right? Or 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 does it have parts of it that you would not recommend an E2 for that and rather an E1? What are the benefits of having recommended an E1 in that particular case? In in the case of the pet food? Yes. Um yeah. So the pet food company, again, that was a little bit unusual because a lot of E1s don't have U.S. entities. But in the case of the pet food company, it had been running, but it was running without a lot of investment, right? He was able to kind of get a, a very, you know, a small warehouse, hire an employee, which usually doesn't count as part of the E2 investment anyway, mm -hmm. you know, and um, a couple of other little minor things, but it wasn't a what we would consider a substantial investment. And so he said, well, I still want to have this business. I still want to come to the U.S. and, and run this business and continue to develop the trade, you know, grow it, developing that trade. But I didn't make the investment and I really don't want to make the investment. And he said, hey, you're importing a lot from your home country. The E1 could work because the E1 doesn't require any investment. That is not part of the requirement. The requirement is based on historical trade, not present or future investment. So that's a huge, uh, that's exactly. a huge factor. And in the case of the others that we talked about a little bit earlier, the Italian, the Mexican, whatever, they didn't want to start a U.S. entity. They already had exactly. an entity. They already had customers, trade, all of that stuff. And their interest wasn't really starting a U.S. entity. The interest was, I need to be able to come over there, stay as long as I want, not worry about trouble at the border. How come you're here? What are you doing? All of those things. And the other issue that they wanted was not blurring that what is work, what is not work line, Correct. right? Correct. So on the, you know, the B1 border crossing card, ESTA, whatever you're currently working with, however you currently get to the U.S. for very short term, you're not supposed to work on those. But what's work is, you know, is setting up a business, is buying something for my business. This eliminates all of that because you have the ability to work and you have the ability to stay essentially as long as you need without any trouble or come back and forth a lot without question. Yeah, exactly. Thank you, Angie. So so that's extremely clear. Uh, so no, no need for that investment and also no need for the U.S. entity. So that that's a that's big correct. game changer for a lot of, of applicants. So so that's that's great that we clarified that. Um, so I wanted to. So you have mentioned it doesn't necessarily need to be goods. It can also be services. So I, I can we use more examples of what those services are, maybe from your clients or maybe from uh, like general knowledge about what those services could be so that people know if, if maybe it can be right for them. Yeah, absolutely. So we talked about one of our clients who's an Italian client um, and he provides services, right? Um, and that's a great one, particularly for Canadians. That is a very, very popular, right? So if you are Canadian and you have some sort of consulting business, IT business, marketing business, you know, something like that, obviously there are many consulting businesses, but if you have something like that, that really could be a great way to get to the United States um, to develop even more of that business. So a great example um, would be somebody who has a, let's take an IT consulting business, right? So the IT consulting business located in Toronto, um, let's say they have three or four employees, all of the IT work goes through those employees in Toronto, right? So they're doing developing, app development, they're doing, um, you know, security, that kind of thing. Uh, those could be great. Uh, they're doing any other type of, you know, IT stuff, unfortunately. Definitely not an expert there, but those types of things, they're all happening in Canada, but they have maybe eight, nine, 10 clients in the US that are needing those types of services. And so, uh, and they wanna continue to get even more clients in the US. So what we would do, the documents that we're going to need or some of the documents that we're gonna need are showing, hey, this is what this company does in Canada. These are the types of services that are happening in Canada, but our clients are located in the US or many of our clients. You can also have Canadian clients too, by the way, but many of our clients are located in the United States. And so we're trading our services happening in Canada are going 
to the U.S. and U.S. clients are trading money to Canada to pay us for those services. That's kind of what they're looking for. Um, so, you know, I guess take it from there as far as what type of consulting work or that kind of thing. Um, but that's the example. And for Canadians in particular, there's a lot of that. But we've had, like I said, people from uh, Turkey. I've had people from Pakistan um, call with interest about that type of thing. It was like a real estate consulting um, and architectural design, that type of thing. So all kinds of different things. Yeah. Great. And in those cases, Angie, so the continuous trade would be evidenced by the invoices and how spaced out they are in a certain period of time. And will the revenue, right. is the revenue rule or substantial rule also applying here uh, about the less than 1 million and more since it's services? Yeah. Exactly. Yes. And in particularly with services, we like to have multiple clients. So sometimes with goods, you might just be buying it from a couple of different you know, sources and that type of thing. But when we're talking about services, we do like to see a variety of different clients. I think we normally say about six different clients in the U.S. that would be paying you. But yes, as far as a substantial, yes, we're looking at your overall revenues and then we're looking at revenues that are derived from U.S. clients. One thing to note that we haven't really mentioned today as well is that the E1, you must have at least 50% of your home country's business trade with the United States. So here is where it could get a little tricky, um, particularly if you're working with goods, because I've seen this a couple of times. So we had a client from the UK that was interested in the E1, but she needed to switch for the e to the E2 for this reason. She had a company that uh, created and manufactured clothing in the UK, but a lot of her clients were in the US. So she was constantly shipping to the US. And so we thought, hey, this could really work out well. Um, she's got goods, they're being manufactured. She had a lot of sales in the United States, everything being shipped to the US. That's awesome. Then she said, oh, but one thing. Next month, a lot of my manufacturing is now going to be handled in China. So now the trade, even though she's not selling to China, but she is importing from China, that counts as trade. Mm -hmm. So you've got to look at your overall imports and exports. Add those up. Does 50% of it happen with the United States. And in that case, it wasn't going to be because she was still selling in the UK. So mm -hmm. let's just say for easy numbers, she was importing $100,000 worth of goods from China mm -hmm. and selling 50,000 in the UK and 50,000 in the US. Mm -hmm. So the overall international trade was 150,000, right? 100 from China, 50 to the US. Mm -hmm. She wasn't at 50%. Because 50% would have been $75,000 in that very simple, basic example. But you have to add those together. So that usually comes in more when you're talking about goods than mm -hmm. services. But you always have to keep that in mind and into the future. So I had another quick example. I had a client from Norway. Mm -hmm. who had a very interesting E1 that we did not handle, but he came to me, we had to convert to an E2 for this reason. So he was doing kind of a property management in New York City, but all of the people that were staying in these apartments were, were students from Norway. Mm -hmm. So all of his clients were Norwegian. It was a really interesting type of E1. But the issue was before but between the time that he had the initial E1 and the time that he came to us, he started taking on more tenants that were not Norwegian. Mm -hmm. So he was concerned that he was going to get to the point that, you know, in the very near future, more than 50% of the clients were not going to be from Norway. So in that instance, we had to change to an E2 because he wasn't going to continue that sustained trade between okay. Norway and the United States. Okay, so in this case, the tenants were the were the goods. Yeah, it was a really <laughs> interesting one. And honestly, I probably would have not ever thought to do an E1. That was another attorney that did that. Okay. But that kind of gives you an example that, you know, if you get this, this E1 visa, mm -hmm. and at some point you think, uh-oh, 
we just got this great contract with France and I don't want to forego that. But now I'm concerned that the trade will not be 50% with the U.S. Now it's going to be, you know, maybe 35% and 65% with France or something similar. We would need to talk about that and figure out, you know, do we switch to an E2? Do you mm -hmm. just kind of give up on the E1? You know, that type of thing. So something okay. to consider. Yeah. And, and without going too deep on that, Angie, if they would choose mm -hmm. to go to an E2, then uh, they would need to establish a company and they would need to do the investment or can the investment that has been done in, in during the time that they have been there with the E1, does that count? So for the E2 investment, um, there's really no time limit to that as long as it's in furtherance of the E2 business, it's personal funds, that type of thing. Mm -hmm. So it is possible that you may be able to convert with limited investment if you have made some along the way and then just do kind of another bit at the end. I mean, that would be a case by case basis, but it's possible, sure. Okay, great. Um, so a lot of people talk about the E2 and it's very popular, uh, the investor visa with its, with its requirements. Uh, why isn't the E1 uh, talked about as much? It's interesting, you know, because the requirements for the E1 are all based in the past, meaning, there's not a lot you need to do in the future other than continue the trade and build the trade throughout the years. The E1 to me seems like a slam dunk. I think one of the reasons is it's kind of a rare visa. Not a lot of people know about it. Maybe not a lot of, and, and because not a lot of attorneys handle them because they are rare-ish, mm -hmm. attorneys don't push them. So clients don't know about them, but for those businesses that do trade, and maybe sometimes people think, oh, I need to start a new business. I don't want to trade with my home country, something like that. So, for, but the, for those, those businesses that already have ongoing trade, the E1 is, in my opinion, great. You don't have to have a U.S. entity. You don't have to have U.S. employees. You don't have to have additional investment. It's great. You know, we're, we're dealing with documents that you probably already have. We need to get a few new documents, but we can kind of guide you through that. And the, the process is shorter. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I mean, you know, for you as well, right? Many times we will require kind of a mini business plan, just describing the past trade, how it looks now, and, you know, the future trade that we'll be building, mm -hmm. but also a shorter business plan, even for you guys as well, right? Okay. Wonderful. Uh, Angie, and so we, we've talked about a little bit about in what ways an E1 is similar to an E2 and also how yeah. they're different. Uh, can we talk about, can you bring the spouse? Can the spouse work? Children um, that, that, uh, that are younger than 21, uh, ability to, to work, all those details about the, yeah. the E2. Can we talk about Family. the E1 in that, in that scenario? Yeah, for sure. So the E1, as far as family can, are concerned, same rules as the E2, right? Spouses can come and work. Unmarried kids under 21 can go to school. It's great in that way. But there's added flexibility for the E1 that the E2 doesn't have. So I get this call a lot, particularly from Mexicans, but I've had this call otherwise. Hey, I don't want to leave Mexico. That's not the plan. But the plan is I want to be able to go more frequently to the U.S. I, you know, and stay if I need to stay. Sometimes I don't need to stay at all, but I want to go two or three times a month for a few days. And I've noticed that people start looking at me a little bit heavier in the airport. And I don't want that hassle. If I need to stay longer and I need to work, I want to be able to do that. The E1 allows for that. In the E2, I always tell people, you're supposed to be directing and developing a U.S. entity. So you really should be here at least seven months out of the year mm -hmm. and not gone for maybe more than six to eight weeks at a time because you need to be running a U.S. entity. Mm -hmm. For the E1, as we talked about, you don't even need a U.S. entity or U.S. employees. You okay. need to be here. The point is growing the trade. So every year you have even more trade with the United States. So if you decide you want to do that, 
maybe your family doesn't come because everybody's continuing to live in, you know, Mexico or Colombia or Canada. But at any point, if you change your mind with the E1, you can move here, go to school, work, those types of things. Okay. Otherwise, you know, everybody can kind of come and go as they please without hassle at the airport and that kind of thing. So a lot of flexibility. And yes, family can come, spouses can work, unmarried kids under 21 can go to school. Yeah. So, so it's basically, Angie, like, I mean, yes, if you want to work and, and go to school and, and, and do everything here, you can. But if it's if you want to use it as an extended B1, it's also uh, an option. Yes. Yes. So it gives you exactly kind of a B1 with benefits okay. and the real benefit comes. So in the short term, that could be very beneficial. No more problems at the airport. You don't have to think in your mind, Ugh, is this considered work? I don't know. Sometimes that is a weird gray area, you know, mm -hmm. but at some point, maybe you use it like that for a year. Hey, I'm coming in, you know, every other week for three or four days and it's working out. And then you go, wow. I'm, I'm starting to get a lot of clients in the U.S. and I really need to be there, you know, three or four months at a time, then back home maybe for only a few weeks, then back for three or four months. You know, so you kind of switch to living in the U.S., working in the U.S. to develop that trade. You could switch on a dime. You can do that. Um, Angie, and something that we haven't touched on is uh, that person, does it need to be the owner of the entity? Uh, like that trades or it can be an employee or how does that work? Yeah. So similar to the E2, the E1 has the uh, visa trader, the E1 trader and the E2, we would call that the E2 investor. So that could be the owner of the company. Yes. Or it could be an employee. Keep in mind that just like they with the E2, the employee is going to have to have the same passport as the owner of the same entity. Country. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. But yes, that could work as well that you send an employee over. Again, it always has to be in furtherance of that trade. So if you're sending an employee over, they probably need to be somebody that's doing, you know, business development, sales, something yeah. like that. Okay. Right. Because we need to be seeing that trade grow and grow and grow each year. But yes, there are E1 employees. E1 employees also bring the spouse, bring the kids. That's doable, too. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, Angie, so you mentioned that uh, that the process was shorter for the E1. Can you briefly explain mm -hmm. how the full process looks like and how long it takes? Yes. Yeah, absolutely. So there are three stages to the E1 visa application, just like with the E2. Number one is document gathering. So with the E2, it can be fast, right? If you already have that entity set up or maybe you're buying a, bi a business that already exists. But for many, when they come to us, which is actually how we like it, so we can help them do it the correct way, you have to set up that entire entity. Sometimes that can take three or four months, sometimes longer. That will depend a lot on the investor. For the E1, we're relying mostly, not entirely, but mostly on documents that already exist because we need to see a history of trade. So depending on how good your bookkeeper is and how quickly you can get those invoices, bills of lading, logistics documents, bank statements, things like that. Um, you know, we can move through a lot of those documents faster. There are a few things we need, potentially a business plan, you know, um, and some other documents regarding what's going to be happening in the U.S., but a bulk of those documents is going to be about what has already happened. Okay. Now, where you could run into issues there is if you really don't have a lot of documents from the past, then sometimes it will take a little bit longer to establish the trade. But we've walked people through that as well. So we will let them know, hey, you've got six months of documents. That's great. Here's what we're going to need going forward. And we can walk them through that. So that's stage number one, which will be shorter if you have uh, good documentation regarding the existing trade. Um, and then stage number two is putting the, the application together. Like the E2, it will take us about two weeks to make sure we have all of the documents in the right order, cutting the pages, all of those things, and then send it to the, the consulate or embassy. And in those instances, those interviews will come at about the same rate as the E2. So the biggest um, reduction in time is usually in the beginning because a lot of the documents you should already have. Wonderful, Angie. Thank you for that. Um, let's talk about the statistics. Um, 
what is the the approval rate for E ones currently? Yeah, so I'd say those are pretty similar to E twos, which mm -hmm. are you know in that uh, ninety ish percentile. So generally, um, they are approved. I think definitely working with professionals will be very helpful for you because um, with the E one. It is going to be based on documents that, for the most part, already exist. However, the key there is going to be, obviously, the organization of those, the substantiality of those, and um, the uh, very clear documentation. So I think that a lot of people who are denied for E1s, maybe they even have all the documents, but they're not laid out in a clear manner and they're not able to articulate exactly what has happened in the past, what's going to be happening in the future. And that's one of those things we do as well. So your documentation is always, in the case of the E1 or the E2, about 50% of it, right? Making it super clear, everybody understands exactly exactly what's going on. That's where an attorney really helps you. And also making sure you have enough documentation. But stage number two is that interview. And so we always do an interview prep with everyone as well. So they're able to articulate standing in front of that officer, exactly what the trade has been, what it's the plans for it, that type of thing. And so that's where your attorney can really help making a very clear application and helping you to be able to articulate um, in front of the consular officer exactly what's going on. Yeah. Thank you, Angie. Uh, I'm going to ask the team to share your information. Um, is it okay that people contact you on your email so that they can have, sure. uh, I mean, they can confirm their eligibility, make sure that their case is, is solid, and then you can take care of them. <laughs> Yeah, okay. for sure. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you so much, and Angie. It has been so, so clear about the E1. I, I want to ask a few questions that we have here from, from the audience today. Um, yeah. I have a person that's asking, is it necessary that, uh, that jobs are added in any way or that indirect or direct jobs are, are shown as, as one of the benefits? It is not a requirement. I, you know, we always would say, you know, it would be nice to show because then they really have incentive to approve it, but it is not a requirement. No. Okay. There's another person who would like to know uh, a little bit more about the case that you mentioned of property management. So can you maybe mention a few real estate uh, cases that, that are E1 related? <laughs> Yeah. That's so, yeah. One. Yeah. This is a tricky one. So, yeah. in the case of the, our Norwegian client that we ended up getting the, the E24 after his mm -hmm. E1. So, he had um, the way he kind of had it set up was he sublet his company, sublet, I don't know, 15, 20 apartments in New York City and set it up for. Um, Norwegian students because they were a lot of short-term renters, right? They were there for a summer program. Maybe they were there for one semester in New York. And anybody who's ever tried to deal with New York real estate knows that it is a wild and woolly world. Um, and so he was, that was kind of his whole thing. This business is going to make it easy for you. Everything's furnished. We've already got it. You're going to be just be, you know, there for maybe three or four months, kind of like a almost like a, a kind of a longer term kind of hotel type of scenario, right? So that was one. Um, what else could I see? I could see, um, no, I did have another person, as I mentioned, reach out to me somewhat recently that had like a real estate company, but that was actually more toward, um, uh, more toward a corporate type clients. So they had a company in Pakistan that was doing a lot of kind of like architectural type uh, designs and things like that um, for corporate U.S. clients. They also were developing, it was some sort of, I don't know if it was like a CAD design program or something that, that corporate uh, clients who were buying apartment buildings and things like mm -hmm. that, or, you know, corporate offices could use for different things. So that's an example as well. So there was a Pakistan company there, but tons of U.S. clients. So if that makes any sense, those are a couple of different examples. But just like with the E2, honestly, as long as you meet the requirements, 
the possibilities are endless. Really, you can do anything you want. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Angie. Uh, we have another question. Uh, somebody is asking if uh, we do business plans for E1. <laughs> so, so yes, I'm happy to say yeah. that we do. Uh, so basically, it's, it's a business plan that's very comprehensive. We're going to include executive summary, um, industry and market analysis. We're going to focus a full section on the trading component. So as Angie was saying, uh, the history, um, the future, we also will add financial projections that are in line with that. We're going to talk about the applicants, uh, the sales and marketing strategy. So everything is going to be there and it's going to be aligned to uh, Angie's strategy and also aligned to the E1 as a trader visa and different to our business plans from, from other types of visas. So yes, we do. And of course, the first step would be for you to speak to, to a lawyer. And Angie is extremely experienced in both E1 and E2. So I would highly recommend her. Um, and then once you do that, then Angie will let you know, hey, you do need a business plan to make this uh, application solid or you don't or let's do it this way. And then we'll adapt and we'll communicate with Angie throughout the process. So, so yes, we're happy to help you with the business plan as well. I don't know, Angie, if you want to add anything to that. <laughs> No, I think, I mean, Mary and Ellen, I, I think you mentioned it kind of at the beginning. We've worked together for a lot of years and uh, with a lot of success. Um, we've never had anyone denied based on marginality before. So, you know, and that's where that business plan goes. Mm -hmm. So obviously we work really well together. I mean, I think that we've referred so many clients to you. We kind of have our own, we, we, we know exactly what each other is looking for. So it's certainly a streamlined process for the clients as well. They don't have to get quite as involved because we already know kind of what the other is looking for within our relationship too, which is great for the clients. It helps as well. Exactly. Thank you. Thank you, Angie. Um, no, I think we're, we've covered all the questions. We've covered also uh, the questions from people attending, people who registered, um, people who registered and attended. Everybody's going to receive a copy and then we'll be sharing, of course, in our in our channels. Uh, Angie, any closing remarks about the E1 visa? Uh, not a lot of closing, but if you are currently trading with the U.S. or if you have currently have U.S. clients, consider it. It's really, really an amazing option. Uh, maybe you didn't even know about it before, but I think that for people who have U.S. clients or are trading goods between you and the U.S., it's a great, great option. Thank you. Thank you very much, Angie. It was a pleasure to have you here on this webinar. I'm so happy that we got to talk about the E-1 visa. Uh, yeah. Like like I said, when I started, I, I think it's a visa that people should be talking about more. So, I mean, for everybody who's here and everybody who's going to watch afterwards, uh, if you if you are interested in some way in this visa, I mean, don't even think about it. Call Angie. <laughs> Thank you, Angie. Thank you. Thanks, Mary and Ellen. Thank Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.